live from Midtown Manhattan, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Hello everyone, welcome back to our CUBE coverage here in New York City, live in Manhattan for the CUBE's coverage of Big Data NYC. Our event, we have had it eight, five years in a row, eight years covering Big Data, Hadoop World originally in 2010, then it moved to Hadoop, Strata Conference, Strata Hadoop, now called Strata Data. In conjunction with that event, we have our Big Data NYC event, SiliconANGLE Media's CUBE. I'm John Furrier, your co-host with Jim Colby, let's analyst at Wikibon com for big data. Our next guest is Gus Horn, who is the global big data and analytics and CTO ambassador for NetApp, uh, machine learning, AI, guru, gives talks all around the world. Great to have you. Thanks for coming in and spending the time with us. Thanks, John, appreciate it. So we were talking before the camera came on, you got, uh, you, you're, you're doing a lot of jet setting really around um, evangelize, but also you know, educating a lot of folks on the impact of machine learning and AI in particular. Obviously AI we love, we love the hype, and it motivates you know, young kids getting into software development, computer science, makes it, makes it kind of real for them, but still a lot, lot more ways to go in terms of what AI really is, and, and that's good, but what is really going on with AI? Machine learning is where the rubber hits the road. That seems to be the hot area, that's your, that's your wheelhouse. Give us the update, where's AI now? Obviously machine learning is super important. It's one of the hot topics here in New York City. Well, I think it's super important uh, globally, and it's going to be disruptive. So before we were talking, I said how this is going to be a disruptive technology for all of society, but regardless of that, what machine learning is bringing is a methodology to deal with this influx of IoT data, whether it's autonomous vehicles, uh, active safety in cars, or even looking at predictive analytics for a, you know, uh, complex manufacturing processes like uh, an automotive uh, assembly line. Can I predict when uh, a, uh, a welding machine is going to break, and can I take care of it during a scheduled maintenance cycle so I don't take the whole line down? Because the impacts are really cascading and dramatic when you have a failure that you couldn't predict. And what we're finding is that um, Hadoop and the big data space is uniquely positioned to help solve these problems, both from quality control uh, and process management, and how you can get better uptime, better quality, and then we take it full circle and how can I build an environment to help automotive manufacturers do test and dev and retest and retraining and learning of the AI modules and the AI engines that have to exist in these autonomous vehicles. And the only way you can do that is with yeah. data and managing data like a data steward, which is what we do at NetApp. So for us, it's, yeah. it's not just about the solution, but there, the underlying architecture is going to be absolutely critical in setting up the agility you'll need in this environment and the flexibility you need. Because the other thing that's happening in this space right now is that technology is evolving very quickly. You see this with the DGX from NVIDIA. You see just P100 cards from NVIDIA. So I, I have a, an architecture that we have in Germany right now where we have multiple you know, NVIDIA cards in our Hadoop cluster that we've architected, but I don't make, I don't make NVIDIA cards. I don't make servers. I make really good ser uh, storage. And I have an, an ecosystem that helps manage where that data is, when it needs to be there, and especially when it doesn't need to be there, so we can get new data. Yeah, Gus, we were talking also before camera, the folks watching that, um, you know, you were involved with AI going way back to your days at MIT, um, and that's super important because a lot of people, in the pattern that we're seeing across all the events we go to, and we'll be at the, the NetApp event next week, Insight uh, in Vegas, but, but the pattern is pretty clear. You have one camp, oh, AI is just the same thing that was going on in the, in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, but it now has a new dynamic with the cloud. So a lot of people are saying, okay, there's been some concepts that have been de developed in AI, uh, in computer science, but now with the, with the evolution of uh, hyper-convergence infrastructure, with cloud computing, with now a new architecture, it seems to be turbocharging and accelerating. So I'd like to have, get your thoughts on, on tying that. Why is it so hot now? Obviously machine learning, everyone should be on that, no doubt. But you got the dynamic of the cloud. Mm -hmm. you, and NetApp's in the storage business, so that's stores, data, I get that. But what's the dynamic with the cloud? Because that seems to be the accelerant right now and with, yeah. with open source and in with, uh, with the AI. Yeah, I, th I think you got to stay focused. The cloud is going to be playing an integral role in everything. Um, and what we do at NetApp as a data steward, and what George Kurian said, our CEO, that you know, data is the currency of today, actually, right? It's really fundamentally what drives business value is the data. But there's one little slight attribute change that I'd like to add to that, and that it's, it's a perishable commodity. 
right? It has a certain value at T sub zero when you first get it. And that's especially true when you're trying to do machine learning and you're trying to learn new events and new things. But it rapidly degrades and becomes less valuable. You still need to keep it because it's historical. And if we forget historical data, we're doomed to repeat mistakes. So you need to keep it and you have to be a good steward of it. And that's where we come into play with our technologies because we have a portfolio of different kinds of products and, and management capabilities that move the data where it needs mm -hmm. to be, whether you're in the cloud, whether you're near the cloud, like in an Equinox, Colo, or even on-prem. And the key attribute there is, and especially in automotive in this, they want to keep the data forever yeah. because of liability, because of intellectual property and privacy concerns. Let's double click on that, hold on, one quick question on this, because I think you bring up a good point. The perishability is interesting because real time, we see this now, batch in real time is the mm -hmm. buzzword in the industry, but you're talking about something that's really important, that the value of the data when you get it fast, at, in context, is super important. But then the historical piece where you store it also plays into the machine learning dynamics yep. of how deep learning and machine learning has to use the historical perspective. So in a way, yep. it's perishable in, in the real time piece in the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, yep. you're a self-driving car, you want the data like in milliseconds, because it's important. But then again, the historical sure. data will then come back. Is that kind of where you're getting at with that? Yeah, because you know, the way that these systems operate is they you know, the, the paradigm is like deep learning. You want them to learn the way a human learns, right? The only reason we walk on our feet is because we fell down a lot, right? But we remember falling down, we remember how we got up and could walk. So if you don't have that historical context, you're just always falling down, right? So you have to have that to build up the proper machine learning, neural network, the kind of connections you need to do the right things. And then as you get new data and varieties of data, and we think, and I'll stick with automotive because it's, it can almost be thought of as an intractable amount of data because most people will keep cars for measured in decades. The quality of the car is incredible now and they're all just loaded with sensors, right? High definition cameras, radars, GPS tracking and you want to make sure you get improvements there because you, you have liability issues coming as well with these same technologies, so. Yeah, so you know, when we talk about the, the perishability of the data, that, that's a given. What is less perishable, it seems to me, in Wikibon, you know, is that the, the, what you derive from the data, the correlations, the patterns, mm -hmm. the predictive models, the, you know, the, the meat of machine learning and deep learning AI in general, is less perishable in the sense that it has a validity over time. Mm -hmm. um, what, is your, what are your thoughts at NetApp about uh, how that, you know, how that der uh, data der of those data derived assets should be stored, should be managed, for backup and recovery and protected. To what extent is that, do those requirements need to be reflected in your storage retention policies if you're an enterprise doing this? No, that's a great question. So I think what we find is that you'll, the, that first landing zone, Yeah. and everybody talks about that being the cloud, and for me it's a cloudy day, although in New York today it's not. You know, there are <laughs> lots of clouds and there are lots of other things that come with that data, like GDPR and privacy and mm -hmm. what are you allowed to store, what are you allowed to keep, and how do you distinguish one from the other. That's one part, but then you're going to have to ETL it. You're going to have to transform that data because, like everything, there's a lot of noise. And the noise is really fundamentally not that important. It's those, those, those um, anomalies within the stream of noise that you need to capture and then use that as your, your training data, right, right, so that you learn from it. So there's a lot of processing, I think, that's going to have to happen in the cloud, regardless of what cloud, and it has to be kind of ubiquitous in every cloud. And then from there, you decide, how am I going to curate the data and move it? And then, how am I going to monetize the data? Because that's another part of the yeah. equation, and what yeah. can I monetize? Well, that's a question that we hear a lot on the queue. We were, on the day one, we were riffing at some of the, the concepts that we see as challenges. Certainly, when we talk to enterprise customers, whether it's a CIO, CDO, Chief Data Officer, or Chief Security Officer, there's a huge application development going on in the enterprise right sure. now. You're seeing the open source booming. There's huge security practices being built up, mm -hmm. and then it's got this governance with the data. Overlay that with IoT, it's a kind of an architectural, I won't say reset, but a retrenching for a lot of enterprises. So the question I have for you guys as a critical part of the infrastructure with storage, storage isn't going away, there's no doubt about that, but now the architecture's changing. How are you guys advising your customers? What are you, what's your position on uh, when you come into a, a CXO uh, sure. and you give a talk yeah. and it's like, I say, hey Gus, the house is on fire, we got so much going on, yeah. bottom line me, what's the architecture? What's best for me, but don't, lose the headroom. I need to have some headroom to grow. That's where I see some machine learning. What do I do? I think you have to embrace the cloud, and that's one of the key attributes that NetApp brings to the table. We have um, 
our core software, our ONTAP software, is in the cloud now. And for us, we want to make sure we make it very easy for our customers to bo go both be in the cloud, uh, be very protected in the cloud with encryption and protection of the data, and also get the, the scale and all of the benefits of the cloud. But on, on top of that, we want to make it easy for them to move it wherever they want it to be as well. So for us, it's all about the data mobility and, and the fact that we want to become that data steward, that data engine that helps them drive to where they get the best, best business value. So because you're agnostic it's be on, in the cloud. on on prem and cloud. Because I know just for yep. the folks, just for the record, you guys have, if not the earliest, one of the earliest in with AWS when yep. it wasn't fashionable. I, I interviewed me, you guys on that many years ago. And let me ask a related question: What is NetApp's position or your personal thinking uh, on what data should be persisted closer to the edge in the new, you know, generation of IoT devices? You know, the, so IoT. Edge devices, you know, they, they do sure. inference, they do actuation and sensing, um, but they also do persistence. Now, mm -hmm. should any data be persisted there long term as part of your overall storage strategy if you're an enterprise? It, it could be. Uh, the, the question is durability, and yeah. what is the, what's the impact if for some reason that edge was damaged, destroyed, or the data lost? Right. So, a lot of times when we start talking about open source, one of the key attributes we always have to take into account is data durability. And traditionally, it's been done through replication. Uh, it's, to me, that's a very inefficient way to do it, but you have to protect the data because it is, it's like if you got 20 bucks in your wallet, you don't want to lose it, right? You might split it into two tens, but you still have 20, right? <laughs> yeah. you, you, you want that durability, and if it has that intrinsic value, you've got to take care of it and be a good steward of it. So if it's in the edge, it doesn't mean that's the only place it's going to be. Right. It might be in the edge because you need it there. Maybe you need what I call reflexive, um, you know, actions, right? This is like when a car as well, you have deep learning and, and machine learning and, and vision and GPS tracking and all these things there on how it can stay in the lane and drive. But the sensors themselves that are coming from Delphi and Bosch and ZF and all of these companies, they also have to have this capability of being what yeah. I call a reflex, yeah. right? The reason we can blink and not get a stone in our eyes, not because it went to our cerebral cortex, Right, because it went to the nerve stem and it, and it triggered the, the, yeah, the blink. Cash, yeah. And you have to do the same thing Active in cash. a lot of these environments. So autonomous vehicles is one. It could be yeah. you know, uh, using facial recognition for restricting access to a game and all of a sudden this guy's on a blacklist. Yeah. You mm -hmm. stop the gate. Before we get into some of the um, uh, product questions I have for you, uh, Hadoop in place analytics, as well as some of the yep. regulations around GDPR, I want to, we're still, again, end the trend segment here is, What's your thoughts on decentralization? You've seen a lot of decentralized apps coming out. You see blockchain getting a lot of traction. Sure. Obviously that's a tell sign, certainly in the headroom category of what may be coming down. Not really on the agenda for most enterprises today, but it does kind of indicate that the, the world is, the wave is coming for a lot more decentralization on top of distributed computing and storage. So how do you look at that as someone who's out uh, on, the, on, the, on the cutting edge? For me, it's just, it's just yet another uh, industry trend where you have to embrace it. It's, I'm, I'm constantly astonished at the people who are trying to push back from things that are coming, right? To think that they're going to stop the train that's going to run them over. <laughs> and, and the key is how can we make even those trends better, more reliable, and do the right thing for them? Because if, we are, if we're the trusted advisor for our customers, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of whether or not I'm going to sell a lot of storage to them, I'm going to be the person they're going to trust to give them good advice as things change, because yeah. that's the one thing that's absolutely coming is change. Yeah. And oftentimes when you lock yourself into these quote commodity approaches with a lot of internal storage and a lot of these things, the, the, the counterpart to that is that you've also locked yourself in probably for two to four years now in a technology that you can't be agile with. And this is one of the key attributes for the in-place analytics that we do with our ONTAP product and we also have our E-Series product that's been around for six plus years in this space as the de facto performance leader in this space even. And by decoupling that storage, in some cases very little, but it's still connected mm -hmm. to the data node, and in other cases where it's shared like in an NFS share, that decoupling has enormous benefits from an agility perspective. Yeah. And that's the key. Well, that kind of ties into the, with the blockchain thing. It's kind of a tell sign, but you mentioned in-place analytics. That decoupling gives you a lot more cohesiveness, if you will, yeah. in each area, but tying them together is critical. How do you guys do that? What's the key feature? Because that's compelling for someone. I want, they want agility. Certainly DevOps is infrastructure as code. That's going mm -hmm. mainstream. Yep. We're seeing that yep. now. That's clearly cloud operations, whatever you want to call it, on-prem, off-prem. Cloud yep. ops is here. 
Yeah. This is a key part of it. What's the unique features of, of why that works so well? Well, some of the unique features we have in, so if we look at our portfolio products, so I'll stick with the ONTAP product. One of the key things we have there is the ability to have incredible speed with our AFF product, but we can also uh, dedupe it, we can, we can uh, clone it and snapshot it, snapshotting it into, for example, N NPS or NetApp Private Storage, which is an Equinox. And now all of a sudden, I can now choose to go to Amazon or I can go to Azure, I can go to Google, I can go to SoftLayer. It gives me now options as a customer to use whoever has got the best computational engine versus I'm stuck there, right? I can, I can now... Um, do what's right for my business. Yeah. And I also have a DR strategy that's it's quite elegant. But there's one really unique attribute too, and that's the cloning. So a lot of my big customers have thousand plus node traditional Hadoop clusters, but it's nearly impossible for them to set up a test dev environment with production data without having an enormous yeah. cost. Yeah. But if I put it in my ONTAP, I can, I can clone that. I can make hundreds of clones very efficiently. So that gets the cost of ownership down, but more importantly, it gets the speed to doing, getting the sandboxes up and running. And the sandboxes are using true production data, yeah. so that you don't yeah. have to worry about, oh, yeah. I didn't have that in my test set, and now I have a A lot bug. of guys are losing budget because they just can't prove it, and they can't get it working, and it's right. too cl clunky. All right, cool, we have, I want to get one more thing in before sure. we, we, we um, get a, run out of time. Um, the role of machine learning, we, we, you talked about, that's super important, algorithms are going to be here, it's going to be a big part of it, but yeah. as you look at that, Policy, where the foundational policy governance thing is huge. So you're seeing GDPR, I want to get your comments on the impact on GDPR, but in addition to GDPR, there's going to be another Equifax coming. It's, they're out there, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's inevitable. So as someone who's got code out there, writing algorithms, using machine learning, I don't want to rewrite my code based upon some new policy that might come in tomorrow. So GDPR is one we're seeing now, you guys are heavily involved in, but there mm -hmm. might be another policy I might want to change, but I don't want to rewrite my software. How should a CXO think about that dynamic? Uh, not rewriting code if a new governance policy comes in, and then the GDPR is obvious. Uh, well, I mean, you, I, I don't think you can be so rigid to say that you don't want to rewrite code, but you want to build on what you have. Yeah. Right, so how can, I, how can I expand what I already have as a product, let's say, to accommodate these changes? Because again, it's one of those trains. You're not going to stop it. So GDPR is, again, it's one of these disruptive uh, regulations that's coming out of EMEA, but uh, what we forget is that it has far-reaching implications even in the United States, right? Because of their ability to reach into basically the company's pocket and find them for violations, right? So, so what's the impact of the big data ecosystem on GDPR? It can potentially be huge, right? The, the key attribute there is you have to start, when you're building your data lakes, when you're building these things, you always have to make sure that you're taking into account, you know, anonymizing personal identifying information or obfuscating it in some way. But it's, it's, it's like with everything. You're only as strong as your weakest link, okay. right? And this is, again, where NetApp plays a really powerful role because in our storage products, we actually can encrypt the data at rest at wire speed, mm -hmm. um, so it's part of that chain. Yeah. So you have to make sure that all of the parts are doing that because if you, have in, if you have data at rest in a drive, let's say, that's inside your server, you know, it doesn't take yeah. a lot to yeah. beat the heck out of it and find the data that's in there if it's not encrypted. Yeah, right? and let me ask you a quick question before we wrap up. So how does NetApp incorporate ML or AI into these kinds of protections that you offer to customers? Um, well, for us, it's again, we're only as successful as our customers are, and what NetApp does as, an, as a company that is, a, we'll just call us the data stewards, that's part of the puzzle, but we have to build a team to be successful. So when I travel around the world, the only reason a customer is successful is because they did it with a team. Nobody does it on an island, nobody does it by themselves, although a lot of times they think they can. So it's not just us, it's our server vendors that work with us, it's the other layers that go on top of it, uh, companies like Zaloni or Blue Data and Blue Talon, people we we've that. partnered with yeah. that are providing solutions to help drive this for our customers. Gus, great to have you on theCUBE. Looking forward to next week. Hopefully, I know you're super busy at NetApp Insight. I know you got like five major talks you're doing, but if we can get some time in the queue, be great. My final question, a personal one, we were talking that you're a, a search and rescue in Tahoe for, uh, uh, in, uh, in case it's an avalanche, or a lost skier. Um, a lot of enterprises feel lost right now, so yeah. you kind of come in a lot and, uh, <laughs> I'll bring my dog. you know, the, the avalanche <laughs> is coming, the yeah, waves or whatever are coming. Mm -hmm. So you've probably seen situations, you don't need to name names, but like, talk about what, what should someone do if they're lost? I mean, you, you come in, you can do a lot of uh, consulting. 
what's the best advice you can give someone? Because a lot of, a lot of CXOs and CEOs, their heads are spinning right now. And yeah, right. there's so much on the table, so much to do. They got to prioritize. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and here's the, the one thing is don't try to boil the ocean. You got to be hyper-focused. If you're not seeing a return on investment within 90 days of setting up your data lake, something's going wrong. Either the scope of what you're trying to do is too large, or you haven't identified the use case that will give you an immediate ROI. There should be no um, hesitation to going down this path, but you got to do it in a manner where you're tackling the biggest problems that have the best hit value for you, mm -hmm. whether it's ETLing, goes into yeah. your plan of record systems, your enterprise data warehouses. You got to get started, but you want to make sure you have measurable, tangible success within 90 days. And if you don't, you have to reset and say, okay, why is that not happening? Am I reinventing the wheel because my consultant said, I have to write all this scoop and flume code and get the data in? Or did I, maybe I should have chosen another company to be a partner yeah. that's done this a thousand times. Yeah. And it's not, their, it's, it's not a science experiment. We got to move away from science experiment to solving business problems. Well, science experiments and boiling over the ocean is don't try to overreach, build the foundational right. building block. Right. The approach. successful guys are the ones who yeah. are very disciplined and they, they want to see results. Some call it baby steps, some say building blocks, but ultimately the foundation right now is critical. Yeah. All right, Gus, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great to, great to chat with you. Great conversation about machine learning impact to organizations. The theCUBE bringing you the data here live in Manhattan. I'm Jeff Furrier, Jim Kobilis, with Vicky Vaughn. More after this short break. We'll be right back. Thank you.